Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, we're kind of at the official end of summer in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. But you know what? What? Sun protection year round. Yeah, it's true. It's true. (laughs) Everybody has that story of like, my cousin got the worst sunburn of their life in December or something similar to that. Yeah. It's because the sun... It's still there. It's still Still there. there. You're still getting rays. Um... I'm always, you know, I, because I'm a very pale person, I'm always thinking about this. Uh, but I also had a chat with one of my neighbors recently about my mowing clothes because I go out in full coverage. I'm sure I look like a crazy Victorian clown witch. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> we can talk more about that on behind the scenes. But uh, that also got me and that neighbor talking a little bit about sun protection, which is, of course, as we have been saying, very important. So I thought it might be good to discuss how we got to the point where nowadays you could buy SPF 100 sunscreen. Certainly not always the case. No. Even in our lifetimes, we've seen a lot of changes in sunscreen. Yeah, I feel like when I was a kid, the max was like, 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that seemed like, I don't know, is that overkill? Uh, it is not. <laughs> not at my house. So, <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the history of sunscreen a bit. And first we'll talk about some very early sunscreen efforts and the ways that people around the globe have protected their skin. And then we're going to focus on the work in the 19th and 20th centuries that developed sunscreen care for pale people like me mostly folks in Europe and North America, although there's an Australian part that comes in there. Uh, And then we're going to talk about some of the more recent developments in the field, both good and bad. It's sunscreen day on Stuff You Missed in History Class. It is. It is. As is often the case, we don't know precisely when people started using sun protection. Most science papers about this mention that since humans generally had dark skin when everyone was clustered around the equator, melanin levels in their skin would have made some kind of sun protection less of a priority. I'll just take a moment to note sun protection is important <laughs> for, everyone. for everyone, regardless of their skin tone. We'll talk about a little bit about why. Yeah. Yeah. So as humanity spread out of that region, more people's skin tones took on paler hues because the climates were cooler. Clothing became more full coverage. And so people, even though they might have paler skin, they were getting less sun exposure overall. Over time, skin pigmentation got less and less. So at some point, it became necessary to find ways to fill the gap that was left by dropping melanin levels in the skin. So that means in the 100,000 years or so, between 300,000 to 200,000 BCE, it's unclear exactly how much any of our ancestors were really intentionally focusing on sun protection. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. There's evidence that various groups of people in sub-Saharan Africa were using ochre in a variety of ways, including the possibility that it was a sunscreen. There are still cultures today that use ochre as sun protection. It does screen or block UV radiation, at least to a degree. Yeah, we don't really get into it here today, but one of the ways, even if you're not trying to necessarily protect your skin with it, Uh, It's entirely possible people were using it around their eyes to dull the glare of the sun, which can cause harm to your eyes, too. Uh, We also know that by the year 3000 BCE, ancient Egyptians were taking care of their skin in terms of its uh, sun protection using things like jasmine, rice bran, and plants related to blue bonnets. The ancient Greeks often used olive oil on their skin. That has been determined in recent years to have an an SPF, and we'll talk about SPF, of eight, uh, at least some versions of it. 
that had been their go-to for skin care. It protected them from the sun, but it was also used as a post-sun moisturizer. And across the globe in the following century, there are things like mercury-based cosmetics, which whitened skin, and those became popular, as we know, in Japan, uh, as well as other countries. Zinc oxide was in use on the Indian subcontinent as a treatment for wounds and preventative from sun blistering as early as 500 BCE. And a paste made from the bark of the elephant apple tree was used to protect against the sun in Burma uh, by at least 100 BCE. And we have known that the indigenous cultures of the American continents have used a variety of natural ingredients to create sun protection for their skin for thousands of years. So putting various compounds on the skin to protect it from the sun is not exactly new. But actual sunscreen, in the sense that we know of it today, didn't really come to be until the 20th century. To talk about sunscreen in the modern sense, though, we need to talk about a handful of people who each contributed a significant piece of the puzzle in the 19th century because there was a lot going on. The science of the sun and its effects on the skin was sort of advancing piece by piece. And we said the 19th century, which I set up Tracy to be a fibber, because the first person we're talking about actually does some stuff in the 18th century, and that's Robert Willen. He's often called the father of dermatology. Willen was a Quaker who was born in Yorkshire, England in 1757. He went to Edinburgh, Scotland for medical school, and then he moved into a position as a physician at a public dispensary in London. And this meant that he was mostly working with the city's poorer residents, and so he was able to see a large number of people who came in with skin conditions. Willen was the first person to develop a classification system of skin diseases in Europe based on an arrangement in the style of Linnaeus. Before his work, skin conditions were treated in ways that usually involved a lot of guesswork because nobody had made an organized effort to like document and compare a wide range of cases to find their commonalities. He presented his initial work to the Medical Society of London in 1795, and in 1798, he started publishing a series of eight books. Each volume covered one of the eight orders of skin disease that he had identified. And though Willen died halfway through this series, leaving only four of the planned eight volumes behind, he did describe a condition that he called eczema solaire, solar eczema. Today, you would see this often called solar dermatitis. And this condition is more specific than sunburn. It refers to an acute or chronic inflammatory reaction to sunlight, so a sun allergy, essentially. And while Robert Willen did not know it at the time, he was describing a condition that was a specific reaction to ultraviolet A, the type of ultraviolet radiation we would call UVA. When most people get a sunburn, that is a reaction to ultraviolet B, UVB light. And UVB is more associated with sunburn. UVA has some other problems. This is kind of what we were talking about when we said everybody use sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Sunburn is not the only problem. You can have other things going on. Uh, Willen's work was carried on, though, by his student, Thomas Bateman, who completed that book series and further advanced the field of dermatological medicine. Just a few years after, Willen started publishing his classification of skin conditions. A German chemist named Johann Wilhelm Ritter added another piece to the scientific puzzle of sunlight and skin health. Ritter was born on December 16, 1776, in Silesia. That was part of Germany at the time, but it's now part of Poland. He started working as a pharmacist in 1791, and after several years in that position, he went to medical school. He also conducted a variety of scientific experiments, including with the decomposition of silver chloride. Photography buffs in the audience probably know that silver chloride is a photosensitive compound. It breaks down in sunlight, and that's why it's used in black and white photography. In 1801, Ritter realized during his experiments that silver chloride broke down even faster in light beyond the violet end of the visible spectrum than it did in the presence of visible light. He had discovered the effects of ultraviolet light. This came right on the heels of Sir William Herschel discovering that there was light beyond the visible spectrum in 1800. But it would still be a while before the connection was made between UV light and sun damage to the skin. 
Ritter moved on to working on experiments in electricity and then died at the age of 33, so he never realized just how important his discovery was. It's It seems like he, we don't really know what he died of concretely. It was probably not directly an electrical accident if that came up as anybody in anybody's mind as a possibility. <laughs> Uh yeah, he he's uh described as having generally poor health and some people have surmised that that may have been exacerbated by some of the experiments he was doing but we do not know. Up until the early 19th century, the belief had been that it was the heat of being out in the sun that was causing skin irritation. So if you got a sunburn, it's because you were baked. <laughs> it was not until 1820 that Sir Everard Home made the case that it was something other than just the temperature causing burns. Home was born in Yorkshire in May 1756, and he did experiments that involved exposing one of his hands to sunlight while covered with a black cloth and noting that it did not get a sunburn, even though it was actually several degrees hotter than it would be without the cloth covering. And he exposed his other hand uncovered as a control for the same period of time, and that hand did get a sunburn on it. So... To him, this was like, this is not a heat issue. He also started to connect the idea of skin pigmentation offering a degree of natural protection. That really hadn't been considered before. But it was still another 70 years before anyone realized that UV radiation could be the source of burning on the skin. That was the work of a Stockholm botanist named Eric Johan Widmark, who came to the conclusion through his own experiments that, quote, the luminous rays have only a subordinate effect on the process studied, i.e. erythema, and that therefore it must be accepted that the ultraviolet rays have the overwhelming importance for these effects. He stated that his experiments, quote, show that the types of radiation with the shortest wavelengths have an effect on the organism. They appear to have the ability, independent of their heat energy, to produce pathologic processes in the body surfaces which are exposed to them in sufficient intensity. Both Widmark and another scientist by the name of Hammer, who worked in Stuttgart, Germany, worked with quinine as a means of screening ultraviolet radiation, and it does absorb UV light, keeping it from penetrating to the skin, at least to some degree. Hammer was the first to assert clearly that a topical treatment might work as a way to prevent sun damage, writing, quote, materials which prevent UVR from reaching the skin protect it from erythema solaire. Coming up, we're going to talk about how chestnut trees entered the sunscreen chat. But first, we will pause for a sponsor break. As an improvement on the benefits of quinine as a screener of UV radiation, the next substance to be tried for the same purpose was escalin derived from horse chestnut trees. And this was part of the work of Paul Gerson Unna, a German doctor born in 1850 in Hamburg. Dr. Unna was the first scientist to connect skin cancer and sun exposure in the 1890s, and he sought preventative substances that could be applied to the skin. In 1911, Unna created and sold a topical lotion called Ziazon, which was 3% escalin, and then he released a follow-up to that called Ultraziazon, which had 7%. Soon, similar experiments and products were being introduced by other doctors and scientists with a variety of sunscreening ingredients. These included tannin in an ointment suspension, and there was even an experiment using procaine injected into the skin. That one was obviously an experiment, not a marketed product. Throughout all of this, there were also analyses of the problems and testing the efficacy of any potential sunscreen. It's hard to test across multiple subjects because different people have different levels of sensitivity to sun exposure. It's hard to replicate sun exposure even day to day if you're using the sun itself as your source because the weather changes And if the test compound isn't applied perfectly evenly, the results are going to be mixed. So today we can create lab scenarios that get around a lot of those issues, but in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was a little trickier. Yeah, there is a a whole paper where where (laughs) these are being outlined, and it's like, okay, but like, it's really hard to measure if 
subject A got the same amount of sunscreen as subject B, and like if the exact depth of its application is the same. And I had not really thought about it, but I'm like, oh yeah, that would have been really hard then. <laughs> Uh, Another development, though, at the end of the 19th century was the successful synthesis of oxybenzone. This, too, was a German development. So oxybenzone is found in some flowers, and it's a derivative of benzophenone. And it is very good at screening UV rays. And it eventually ended up in a lot of sunscreens, although it took several decades for that to happen. It wasn't until the 1950s that oxybenzone was recognized for its potential in sunscreen use, but oxybenzone has some problems. We're going to get to those later in the episode. Even though the concept of UV protection entered the picture as a feature of products applied to the skin for sun exposure, in the 1920s, people were thinking more about tanning. This started quite early in the 20th century, just after World War I, This was because in the post-war period in Europe and the United States, there was more cultural emphasis on doing fun things and engaging in healthy outdoor activities. So having kind of a sun-kissed look became pretty popular for people with fair skin. Sometimes this trend is credited to Coco Chanel because in 1920, pictures of her with a tan were published after she got back from a cruise vacation. Yeah, there is one account that suggests that she invented sunbathing. Probably not. Uh, But there was simultaneously an effort to focus on the more protective angle of sunscreens. Joseph Maria Eder was a Viennese chemist, and he was born in 1855. His place in history is mostly related to photography because he specialized in chemical development processes. But he noticed in the course of his work that photographers often came down with ailments that were likely related to the chemicals that they worked with. So to get a better understanding of the situation and perhaps improve it, he partnered with a man named Leopold Freund, who was a radiologist born in 1868, to study those ailments. And one of the things that they realized was that ultraviolet light was causing skin damage in photographers and other people as well, presumably. So they developed a product called Antilux to provide UV protection. One of the ways that they demonstrated the efficacy of their product was to use this cream that they created to write the word Antilux on the backs of volunteers and then expose them to UV light. And as the subjects developed sunburn or tan, The word stood out in stark white against the sun-affected areas. They would take pictures of them. You can find them online. Um, I can't imagine wanting a corporate logo sunburned upon my back, but uh, this was a good way to show how effective it was. Yeah, I want to avoid being sunburned in general. Yes. In 1932, Australian consumers had their first chance to purchase a mass-market sunscreen. It was created by Adelaide chemist H.A. Milton Blake, Once Blake had a formula that he thought would work, he tested it at the University of Adelaide. He had that test done by a professor named Kerr Grant. Testing showed that this was effective, and Blake started Hamilton Laboratories, combining his first initials and middle name. His sunscreen used the compound phenyl salicylate as a sunscreening agent, and his company is still going today, although now it's part of key pharmaceuticals. French pharmacist. Eugene Schuller was born in 1881, and after receiving his chemistry degree in 1904, he started making hair color and distributing it to salons in Paris. That hair color name is going to be familiar. It was Oreal, so he was the founder of L'Oreal. By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, he had founded a hair care company that eventually grew into L'Oreal. That was not its original name. In the early 1930s, the successful Schuler started to sunbathe on his boat while traveling, and he recognized the need for a product that would care for the skin during sun exposure. The result was a product called Ambre Solaire, a sun tanning oil that was advertised as protecting the skin. Schuler marketed it as huile filtrante, meaning filtering oil. 
It didn't really screen UV rays at the levels that we would seek out today, but it did definitely provide emollient moisture. And this led to an entire industry of suntan oils. You can, of course, still get suntan oil today, although modern versions do provide at least a low SPF level of sunscreen. Some oil just does naturally offer a little sun protection. Even olive oil, as we mentioned before, used by the ancient Greeks, has an SPF of roughly 8. The next big step in the development of sunscreen came from Switzerland, but this part of the story starts and then stops for a little bit while some other things happened in the background. It begins with Franz Greider, who was born in Wittenberg, Tyrol, in the Austrian Alps in 1919. He became a chemist as a profession, but he was also a mountaineer in his free time, and these two combined to lead to advances in sunscreen. Greider often hiked through the Alps, and on one particular climb of the mountain called Pitzbuen in 1938, he got a really bad sunburn. He had been sunburned before while climbing, but Pitzbuen, which is in the Silveretta mountain range in the Alps, on the Austria-Switzerland border, is really one of the higher mountains in the area. It's 10,866 feet, or 3,300 meters, prolonged exposure in climbing as well as the higher altitude meant that he got a particularly bad sunburn. As he was recovering, he decided he wanted to work on developing something that could help climbers protect their skin while still enjoying their mountaineering hobby and could protect anybody else who wanted to protect their skin from the sun. We're going to come back to him because he's going to go away and work in a lab. And meanwhile, World War II began. German troops used Dr. Una Ziazon for sun protection. And on the U.S. side of things, one of the men who enlisted to serve as an airman was a pharmacist from Miami named Benjamin Green, who was part of a test of early sunscreens. Red Veterinary Petroleum, known more casually as Red Vet Pet, is a petroleum product used to treat cuts and abrasions, and it was part of airmen's first aid kits during the war. Green and a lot of his fellow airmen had a lot of issues with sunburns on missions and would apply their Red Vet Pet to their faces. This is one of those things where, depending on the source you read, this is sometimes credited as though it was Green's idea, but that is not the case. It was part of a planned use for Red Vet Pet by the military as part of a test of sun protection pastes. To manage the scientific investigation of these pastes, the Army Air Force Material Center contracted General Electric Lighting Laboratories and researchers from the Western Reserve Medical School. And that project, which was classified, sought something that was inexpensive, non-toxic, and stable at variable temperatures that could protect the skin of soldiers. Red Vet Pet fit the bill, and it was selected by the team for inclusion in emergency kits. And the Red Vet Pet helped. It was not exactly comfortable, though. Red Vet Pet is sticky and heavy. It has an unpleasant odor. After the war, back in his pharmacy, Green started to work on combining the Red Vet Pet with other ingredients to create a lotion that would be less sticky and more appealing for general use. So he added cocoa butter and coconut oil, and that was the genesis of Coppertone brand suntan oil, Incidentally, the Coppertone girl that has become an iconic marketing figure was not attached to the product until 1953 when the company hired Joyce Ballantyne to draw a new mascot. Ballantyne used her three-year-old daughter, Sherry, as the model for this little girl getting her swim bottoms pulled on by a dog. Uh, prior to the introduction of the Coppertone girl, the company used the image of a Native American person on the label, uh, I'm just going to say that's not at all unique to Coppertone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, uh, you know, it's like if you go back and you look at historical bottles, you're like, this doesn't doesn't look the same. No. Where's the kid? Uh, that's where she is. So we're going to talk again about Franz Greider. But before we do, we will hear from the sponsors that keep the show going. <laughs> In 1946, Franz Greider once again appears, this time to bring the results of his work to market. And that was in a product called Pitzbuen Glacier Creme, which translates to glacier cream. This product and others that he worked on were developed alongside Greider's wife, Marga, who is usually referred to as a beautician when you read about them, but really she would be more 
likely closer to what we would call an esthetician in modern parlance. She was an expert in skin care and uh, skin health. So together, they wanted to not only meet consumer desires for getting a tan and preventing a sunburn, but also to provide excellent skin care. The concept of SPF ratings came after these early sunscreens, and that is another effort that's attributed to Franz Greider. But to be clear, he did work in the area, and he helped popularize the concept of SPF, but there had been other scientists before him working on that idea. SPF, of course, means sun protection factor, and it's a rating that shows how much sunburn protection a product has. It's determined by testing that shows the amount of UV exposure you would need to get a sunburn when wearing the product versus when you are wearing nothing. This is a thing that uh, more modern discussions of make very clear that this does not have to do with time but the amount of UV radiation hitting you. So the higher the number, the better you're protected. But that rating only applies to UVB rays, not UVA. Additionally, it's been estimated that because of incorrect application, many users only really get half the label value benefit of any sunscreen's SPF. Uh, This has led to calls from some researchers to scrap SPF altogether in favor of a new, more accurate system, That idea hasn't gotten any real traction, at least not that's hit market yet. We can talk more about why the time thing has been uh, repeated so much historically versus how now they're saying amount of radiation. Uh, Initially, that is what what it was kind of marketed as. Greider continued to work in the sunscreen field for decades. In 1967, papers across the U.S. and Europe ran headlines like, suntans with pay offered. The articles were all reporting on how Greider was recruiting young women to be part of his latest tests, and that came with a trip to Spain. The chosen ladies would have their skin divided into squares with a different formula used on each section to see how all of them performed. Greider was quoted as saying, quote, good protection against the sun must also be good for the skin besides aiding a quick tan. We are working on the problem of how to avoid wrinkles forming while sunbathing. Uh, I'm going to tell you, Greider, that's not going to work. <laughs> uh, he particularly wanted redheads for the study, quote, because of their sensitive skin. Even into the early 1980s, Franz Greider and his company were at the forefront of the developing sunscreen science, introducing formulas, for example, that were broad spectrum and water resistant. Although, by today's standards, as Tracy just hinted, the protection protocols that were developed by his company then are really woefully lacking. For example, in 1981, Pitts Buen printed what was called the tan plan on all of their packaging, and it suggested using a high SPF product meaning one with a six or eight rating, for several days of sun exposure before trading down to a three or four SPF uh, to ensure a perfect tan. Because by that point, your skin would be producing melanin. Uh, We know that that's not enough. And at the time, the SPF 8 cream that was on the market was like the big number, and it was touted as given, quote, almost total screening to facial skin. Just a few years before that, in 1977, the importance of screening UVA rays was finally recognized. Prior to that, the idea had been that because UVB rays were the ones that caused sunburn, those were the ones most sunscreens focused on. That enabled uh, UVA rays to help sunbathers get the tans that they wanted, But in the late 1970s, scientists realized that UVA rays were causing long-term damage to the skin. UVA rays make up 95% of UV radiation, and they can cause all kinds of problems, including premature aging and indirect DNA damage that includes skin cancer. Right on the heels of this information regarding UVA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration introduced sunscreen regulations, and they approved 14 UV filters, meaning substances used in sunscreen products that absorb UV rays and prevent them from penetrating through to the skin. The most commonly used today are aminobenzoic acid, oxybenzone, avobenzone, octosalate, and octocrylene. 
The early 1980s saw a huge jump in SPF products, with the first SPF 15 sunscreen introduced. The decade of the 1980s also saw the first controversy surrounding a UV filter ingredient. Para-aminobenzoic acid, referred to on sunscreen labels as PABA, all caps, began to be reported as causing allergic reactions, and more problematic was found in one study to cause damage to DNA. It wasn't banned by the FDA at that point. That didn't happen for a long time. But a lot of companies went ahead and reformulated their products to exclude PABA as an ingredient. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, my mom specifically looking for PABA free. Uh And it was because we thought that it was irritating my skin. I was sensitive to some things. Because it was. Yeah. Another development in the 1980s was the introduction of colorful zinc oxide products meant not to blend into the skin, but to add some flair. This is important because it marks the rise of a product different from sunscreen, and that's sunblock. So sunblock includes either zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, both of which reflect UV rays away from the wearer. All the products we've mentioned before this are what would be called sunscreen, meaning they absorb UV rays and prevent them from getting to the skin. Franz Greider died in 1985 at the age of 66. He essentially worked right up until his death. His company, Greider AG, was acquired by Johnson & Johnson in 1989. It still exists and still sells sunscreen under the Pittsburgh brand name in Europe. It wasn't until 27 years ago, as we record this, so 1996, that avobenzone, which specifically protects against UVA rays, was introduced to the market. Greider and others had been incorporating ingredients into sunscreens that targeted UVB and offered some protection against UVA, but this was the first that was really made specifically to guard skin against UVA. Today, of course, you can buy sunscreen that is rated SPF 100, as we mentioned at the top of the episode. Although the Skin Cancer Foundation notes that outside of lab conditions, the reality is that an SPF over 50 may give users a false sense of security, when really any product should be reapplied every two hours or more often if you're engaging in activities in the water or where you might sweat a lot. Yes, even if the label says they are water and sweat resistant. So then the benefit of a super high SPF is really only marginally better than something rated SPF 50. The one caveat here is for people with extremely sensitive skin or, for example, if you have albinism or some skin condition, then go like all the way is go for what it. you should always do every time. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of my like sport sunscreens say on the label, 80 minutes. (laughs) 80 minutes in sweating or wet conditions. Uh, The development of sunscreen to protect human skin has, according to a number of studies, come at a cost to the environment. A lot of the ingredients used in sunscreens have been identified over the years as harmful to plant and animal life. That's particularly the case in the kinds of places people are most likely to slather themselves in sunscreen, which is beaches, Oxybenzone in particular can wreak havoc in ocean ecosystems, particularly with coral. Hawaii banned oxybenzone in 2018, as well as octanoxate. Other areas known for the fun in the sun tourism have done similar. But there is ongoing debate about what really is and is not safe in sunscreen when it comes to the environment. And as you said, studies have been conducted that show that oxybenzone and other ingredients cause problems like coral bleaching and abnormal growth in corals. But other studies indicate that it would be almost impossible to achieve the levels that would cause those sorts of problems, even in waters that are filled with sunscreen-slathered tourists. There's also an additional complication here that messaging that suggests that some sunscreens are not environmentally safe might cause people to skip them. And that is, of course, also not safe at the individual level. People should be wearing sunscreen. There have been some sunscreens to hit the market that tout environmentally safe ingredients, although there is really not any regulation around the terms you'll see on them, like reef-friendly or others that that are often used. So... Honestly, this is a kind of ongoing and developing debate of what is reef-friendly and reef-safe and whether or not any company should be claiming that because we don't know. Uh, So 
Please always wear your sunscreen. I beg. <laughs> I beg. Uh, I wear so much of it. I hate it, though. Maybe we'll talk Do about you? that. Do oh, you? We'll talk about my favorite sunscreen. We are not endorsed by it, but I love it. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, in our behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you have some listener mail? <laughs> I do, because it delighted me. So we have a variety of delightful listener mail. We've had a lot of pets. Uh, This one is not about pets. It's about marathons. And this is from our listener, Marsha, who writes, Dear Holly and Tracy, I just finished your episode on the 1904 Olympic marathon. And when you mentioned Cuban mail carrier Felix Carvajal, it reminded me of my brother-in-law, Mark, also a mail carrier for the USPS and his marathon experience. Like Carvajal, Mark has always been fit, but never professionally trained as a runner. He played multiple sports all his life and was very good at baseball and softball especially, but for him, sports have always been about fun times with people he enjoys. In the late 70s, also at a time when hydration and high-tech shoes and clothing were still relatively unstudied, he signed up for a fundraising event seemingly out of the blue. He did no training for this full marathon except to run a half marathon the week before the race just to see if he had the stamina. Well, he finished the race. That was his first and only full marathon, and we can never get over how few side effects he experienced. The most he ever admitted, and only to my sister slash his wife, was that over the next few days delivering mail door to door, he chose to step backwards down the doorsteps because it was less painful for his very sore leg muscles. He is amazing and a very humble example of a great human being. Thought you would like an upbeat note after those campaign finance episodes. I have been listening since the podcast was titled Factor Fiction, so I earned my PhD before I even knew that was a thing. Thank you for your excellent research, very professional delivery, and vast range of topics, and your skill at making sometimes complex topics very comprehensible. We no longer have any pets, landlords rule, but I sure do enjoy episodes on famous landmarks. Sincerely, Marsha. Uh, I love this story because I know exactly what that sensation is mm-hmm. of not wanting to go down steps. Mm-hmm. Like, I have always said, and I think a lot of people that do a lot of sports and specifically running will say when they're very, very sore, they can walk up steps okay, but down is a whole different story. And it's because, like, both the bend of your knee and for a lot of people, I know for me, like, those muscles at the back of your legs, kind of at the base of your glutes are like, oh, no, thank you, when you try Mm -hmm. to do, like, the bend (laughs) down. So I usually have employed not a backwards maneuver because I'm too scared. I'll do a sideways situation. But if you're stepping onto the straight leg instead of a bent leg, it just makes it easier for me and apparently many other people. Um, thank you so much for this this email. I, too, have had friends that have done marathons with no training. Um, that is very scary to me. But if you're very fit to begin with, I don't recommend it, but I still think you can get away with it, uh, as clearly Mark did and many others have. Felix. Uh, If you would like to write to us about your lack of marathon training, your pets, or anything else, you can do that at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet and you think you want to, you can do that on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.